My name's Andy Crabb, I work for Dartmouth National Park Authority as one of their archaeologists and today we're going to talk about the Bronze Age and Dartmoor is internationally famous for its well-preserved Bronze Age landscape, sites and monuments which we have in abundance and we're going to look at two aspects of life and death on Dartmoor as told via two excavations which have taken place in the last 10 or so years from which we have extracted lots more information uh, and increased our understanding about this wonderful period. And also, if you come and visit Dartmoor later in the year, hopefully our visitor centres will be open, and in particular the new visitor centre at Postbridge, where you'll be able to see our much enlarged and improved Bronze Age exhibition. We're going to look at the death aspect of Bronze Age and burial practices and possibly beliefs by looking at the White Horse Hill Kissed Burial Excavation, which we undertook in 2011. Uh, and then we're going to turn our attention to the more uh, profane side of Bronze Age life by looking at the excavation of the Bell of a Hut Circle, which took place due to budget uh, limitations from 2008 to 2014. Okay, uh, the first site we're going to look at on the death side of things is the White Horse Hill Kist. Uh, that's way up on the North Moor in the military ranges. And our second site, to look at the life element of the Bronze Age, is the excavation of the Bell of a Hut Circle in the large forestry plantation right in the middle of Dartmoor, Belliver, very close to a uh, post bridge. So let's start with White Horse Hill. As you can see from this aerial shot, it's a pretty bleak place. Traditionally, we thought not a lot of archaeology survived up here. Uh, the nearest site is about a kilometre away, which is a burial cairn. You can take out a pimple in the top right hand corner of the image, and that's Hanging Stone Hill Cairn. There's a fine well, we think it's Bronze Age Cairn there. But in about 2000 or so, a local amateur archaeologist called Joe Turner noticed this peat hag right in the middle of the screen. And I hope you can see my laser pointer highlighting the area. And in this peat hag, in the section, the exposed section, he discovered this kist. Now, a kist we knew about on Dartmoor and elsewhere in the southwest of England and elsewhere as a burial chamber. Uh, these burial chambers are kind of very uniformly built. They're granite boxes. And the name kist vein comes from the word uh, uh, kiss for chamber and vein, which from the Cornish word main for stone. And they're often parallel boxes uh, with the long axes arranged northwest, southeast. And of the 200 or so we have on Dartmoor, at least 95% of those have this alignment. It must have been symbolic to the people who were buried in them and the people who built them, but we haven't fathomed out why at the moment. As you can see, this kist and this side of the peat had this island of peat, which has escaped later extraction, uh, is about half a metre in, uh, across, and, so, and the internal chamber is about 40 centimetres deep. Uh, and we didn't realise that we were looking at the actual side of the kist chamber here. So we're kind of looking east across the middle of it, we thought we were looking down the long axes of the chamber. So that let us have a little, little bit of a surprise later on. Now the kiss on Dartmoor had been the subject of many early antiquarian excavations. Some of them have names like the Crock of Gold or the Money Pit, so you can understand that people thought they'd go and seek their fortunes by trying to find treasure within them. And unfortunately that led to a lot of unrecorded excavations. But with the emergence of archaeology in the late kind of 19th century as its own discipline, uh, people did start to record what they found, or more likely what their workmen they'd sent up to do the work for them found. And it seemed like kiss were pretty barren. With the acidic nature of Dartmoor soils from all the peat, organic remains weren't often surviving. So we often found remnants of pottery associated with a style called beaker uh, ware. Uh, which kind of relates to the beginning of the Bronze Age, a period when society was developing metalworking skills and developing a more stratified social system. Also found were flint scrapers, flint arrowheads, uh, and as the antiquarians called it, lots of inblown organic material. And try and remember that phase, because uh, we did find some of that ourselves, and it turned out to be something rather different. Okay, so as you can see from the next slide, being located at 600 metres above sea level, facing the southwest prevailing winds, uh, the site was in a very fragile and precarious state. 
after 2000, uh, we built that dry stone wall to protect the kist. But unfortunately, on either side, you can see how the wet weather, which froze in winter, then forwards in the, in the warmer daylight condition, uh, caused all this tremendous weathering and erosion. And great slabs of peat were rapidly being uh, whittled away from this island of peat. And on the top, that wasn't bad enough, sheep and walkers congregating on the top. This is one of the highest points on Dartmoor, were kind of eating in from the top of the hag as well. So it's only really a matter of time and only a few bad winters before that kist was unstable and collapsed. So we decided to take a chance and do some excavation. And based on the kind of antiquarian reports and the last excavation of a kist in the 1940s, where again, not much was found beyond some flint tools, we weren't really expecting much, uh, well, way, uh, much in the way of artifacts to be found. Now, the excavation was undertaken by the Cornwall Archaeological Unit, who are neighbours from across the Tamar, and uh, very, very experienced working in granite conditions in upland landscapes in the southwest. They've also dealt with some Bronze Age burials themselves quite recently, before 2011, when we decided to excavate. And so they were the ideal candidates and the ideal unit to carry out this excavation. Here you can see, I think this is the end of day two, almost, of the excavation where they've just started to do some uh, recording. They've removed the overlying peak to reveal the capstone. And you can see a lot more of the structure of the kist. You can see how we're seeing into the chamber from that collapsed stone, but the parallel sides of the stone chamber are still standing and how it's collapsing under the own weight of that tremendous capstone. You will also notice how the peak section has been cleared up. The archaeologists have identified different layers of uh, peat. They're looking at peat stratigraphy so they can understand the formation processes of the peat and try and work out if the kist originally stood on an early ground surface or it was dug and constructed into a trench. On the right hand side you can see these three monolith tins and they're inserted to extract peat in a kind of chronological sequence so scientists in the laboratory can extract pollen analysis information testate amoeba, macro fossils, tephra from volcanoes, all these tremendous things um, in science and archaeological science can uh, apply and extract information from, which to our antiquarian and early archaeological forebearers was just the four realms of fantasy. And I forgot to mention that in 2000, we did take some dates from, uh, we did take a peat core from the other side of the, of the kist, and we the lower peat, round about where the pointer is uh, located now, was about four and a half thousand years old. So that makes it kind of a late to mid, mid to late Neolithic, late Stone Age. And at the top, the peat was around four thousand to three thousand eight hundred years old, just on the cusp of the of the Bronze Age period. And peat is a really nasty substance, difficult substance to dig if you're an archaeologist, because you're looking for patterns. Of Distinctions. And in the plastic material like peat, which is all the same colour almost, it's very difficult to see those boundaries and changes in contrast. You need to look for a cut or a trench where it gives you some clues about when the kiss was built. Okay, so on the third day, and they only had three days to do this excavation, artifacts started to emerge and we started to get very excited. The first thing which we indicated that there was probably a burial intact within the kist. There was a shale disc bead which emerged. And then probably a few hours later, <clears throat> when they were digging around the back of the kist after the capstone was lifted, we found a hazel stake. Now this hazel stake, the later date was radiocarbon dated and turned out to be uh, three and a half thousand years old. And under a microscope, it looked like the ends here had been deliberately cut. And the tool marks had shown it had been sharpened. So we've speculated that this may have been a marker post or maybe a support to help hold the kiss together if it was inserted into the kiss to help stop it collapsing. So we're getting quite excited. And as we excavated the area around the capstone, underneath we found this. Yeah, uh, it's kind of like jumbled mass of organic material. And then we realized, well, we think hit the jackpot here and what the early antiquarians were describing as material like 
grass or other uh, grasses which may have blown in and accumulated over the years and rotted away, we're thinking, well, this is a sealed deposit. This is probably the real thing. This is probably a cremation, which makes you wonder about all those early cremations, the early antiquarians may have um, and inadvertently discarded. Well, unfortunately, this was the last day of the excavation. There was no way we could come back as rain was forecast and, uh, and excavate this in situ another day. So we decided to wrap the whole deposit up in cellophane, complete on its base slab, that granite base slab, which the whole deposit was uh, uh, deposited on, and to wheel it off about three kilometers back for the waiting vehicles. Unfortunately, it was Oakhampton fair days, so there were no farmers available or commoners. They're all at the fair, so no quad bikes could come and rescue us. And the deposit then found its way to the Wiltshire Conservation Laboratory in Chippenham, part of Chippenham Museum. And here they had the luxury over the next four or so months to undertake a micro excavation of the kiss of the, uh, the deposits we've extracted from the kiss. It might be just worth noting that the stones themselves, when they excavated that kiss, seem to have been deliberately chosen. The stones all seem to have a tapering appearance. And if they were digging in peat, uh, there was hardly likely to be any available stone on the surface available for the builders. So it could be likely that part of the ritual of construction kiss, they had to select stone from somewhere significant to them and bring it to that location on top of Whitehorse Hill to construct the burial chamber. Now, Helen Wilson of the Chippenham Lab uh, was confronted with this mass of organic materials. And after the initial clear up, this was what they were presented with. You can see this rather compressed, heavily pressurized slab of dark material. But within that, they were able to carry out a careful excavation and reveal a really significant and remarkably well preserved sequence of organic remains, which should take to make this amazing story of the, the person who was developed, uh, buried within the kist. But before they started excavation, they took the lab to the Salisbury Hospital for a good old x ray. And that really got the, uh, the taste buds tingling because as they scanned it, you could start to see structures uh, and <clears throat> jewelry and objects being filled within that deposit, which suggested that there may be necklaces and jewelry and other artifacts preserved within there. And in the left hand picture on that black and white slide image, sorry, you can see some coiling. So we yeah, may be actually going to remain an object to or something preserved in situ. So on the careful excavation, uh, Helen and her, uh, her colleagues, as I said, took four months of painstaking work. And of that deposit, which was about centimetres in depth, they carefully quadrated it and then took out spits about one to two centimetres at a time so they could identify and carefully extract objects and clean them and conserve them so they could be looked at by specialists in the field and we could extract all this information. And this photo here, this image here is a close-up of what turned out to be a basket container being excavated. And you can just make out in the foreground here some really highly skilled and very beautiful stitching around the lip of the container. You can just make out some coils of woven material as well and objects and from the opening of the basket itself, this large disc and these smaller circular features as well. And it was absolutely stunning. And after their work and after their careful cleaning, it revealed this uh, almost complete, like it was made only a few years ago, a uh, basket container. And on closer analysis, the material they used for this was the, the lime bast from the lime tree. And that's the inner bark of a lime, which has been carefully processed and retted in water to make it workable and malleable and pliable so it can be bundle coiled to make this tube of coiled material, which had two circular discs stitched to it on either end to make a container. <clears throat> and the experts think this would have been worn with a cord rather like a drum satchel around the side of the body. But they weren't prepared because this, this is a unique object for the early Bronze Age in Britain. Nothing like this has been found before. It's a high level of skillful stitching and workmanship which went into this. 
the stitching was used with uh, they used cow hair for this uh, and the cow hair was carefully selected they used darker cow hair on the top of the of, of the, the, the the basket to make a lovely decorative feature which was hinted at in that earlier slide and elsewhere on the on the uh, basket uh, they deliberately alternated darker and lighter hairs to make a checkered pattern as well so a lot of careful thought and time had gone in to making this container excuse me i'm just going a drink <clears throat> now that container is about 27 centimeters long and about 25 centimeters wide give or take but as i say it's unique for britain for the early bronze age and that was pretty great in itself to find this level of preservation but inside we started to find all these beads and other objects which really really increased the excitement levels even more and as these were carefully cleaned up and analyzed we found out we had various different types of materials here and what we're looking at is a composite necklace we had 110 clay beads and when the clay was looked at under a microscope it looked like these clay beads were made locally somewhere over in devon somewhere in the river basin where the uh, the gravels have been washed down from the granite of dartmoor because you can tell that by looking at the mica and the range of the mica minerals within that clay so it's 110 of those and they've been carefully fired we also found well i didn't the archaeologist who had the job of excavating this 22 <coughs> give or take shale beads beautifully cut and carefully polished and perforated shale beads which we believe came from Kimmeridge Bay in Dorset about 80 kilometers away that seems quite a long way that's not a patch compared to the amber beads which we think came from the Baltic coast in what is now known as Poland or Eastern Germany there were seven of these beads these again had been worked carefully polished but intriguingly these had some wear on them so it may have been that these either came from an earlier necklace or that the necklace had been handed down through the generations they got worn and torn and they accumulated all the scratches as they do through their life history and passed down to kind of family heirloom and really exciting we found the remains of a tin bee we're talking about the bronze age bronze is an alloy of tin and copper minerals which appear abundantly in the southwest of england if you could find that evidence of prehistoric tin activity it'd be amazing in the bronze age and we think they must have been extracting and processing tin and dark more there's evidence for that or slight evidence for that down there's some oxygen on the granites there but we haven't found any of that yet on dark more mainly because of later workings have probably destroyed those early extraction and processing sites so to find a tin bead was really exceptional so found the crushed remains of what we think was another one so the uh, <clears throat> the jewelry the prehistoric jewelry specialist who looked at this and it was carefully excavated and the positions of all these beads were carefully uh, plotted and worked out and the runs they occurred and were carefully analyzed I think the jewelry may the necklace sorry may have looked something like this uh, a tin bead in the center the amber beads on either side then the clay beads and then the shale beads these aren't all 210 beads these are just to give a flavor of how that necklace may have been strung together and we think the necklace was about 50 centimeters in length maybe sorry 58 centimeters in length and the beads accommodated about 50 centimeters of that total uh, length of the necklace uh, three other types of composite necklace have been found in the southwest as well Often they contain shale beads, sometimes jet from Whitby, and sometimes amber. And I think this is the first one to have tin within it as well. Now the eagle, are, oh, and the other thing, we think this necklace was strung with sinew, animal sinew. There was nothing to suggest there was a metallic thread or a metallic wire used to string these. That would have left the chemical signature, which we would have picked up in the laboratory. Now I'll just go back one slide because the eagle-eyed of you would have noticed a wooden stud appear and we wonder what they were and in the end four of those turned up and these are the actual wooden studs covered up uh, so about nearly four thousand years old it's turned a uh, woodworked timber which uh, turned out to be spin wood which occurs locally on dartmoor and this had been turned on the lathe and 
tool marks on there from a chisel, probably a bit of flint used to make those patterns. We had four together, two small pair, two, one small pair and one larger pair. And we think these were the, used for facial ornamentation as nose studs or ear studs or possibly lip studs as well. So you can imagine the impressive visual appearance the wearer of these would have had. <clears throat> now we're going to find, we also found another bit of jewellery as well. Uh, and this is shown up on the kind of colour microscopic x-ray from the Cardiff Museum, uh, which was taken by Mary Davis. And this is done with a spectrometer, which shows that each of these yellow kind of clusters is in fact a tin bead. And we think this is either an armband or a bracelet. It's about 27 centimeters long. And you can see a large kind of lozenge at the end, which turned out to be the seed pod of maybe a sunflower or an honesty plant as used as a fastener. The other one's been lost on the other end. It looks like some type of deep sea creature. But we've got 35 surviving tin beads and if you look carefully you can see they have a dumbbell pattern. When it was cleaned up, here's a photograph of it, you can just see that that's how it looked like after some conservation works had gone on and when it was finally cleared up and cleaned you can see the high level of care which had gone into making this amazing uh, object, this amazing uh, what, uh, bracelet. Uh, it consists of 12 or 11, sorry, or 22 cow hairs, which we think came from the cow's tail, stitched carefully together, woven around these tin beads. When the replicas were made, the expert who had a look at this was, it took them forever, it took them weeks to try and get this done. So that just, and these were pretty, these are a pretty good jeweler in their own right. So it just shows you the level of craftsmanship which was required to make something like this and the brilliant eyesight and nimble fingers which were required. And this has led some people to think this may have been made by a child or a young person. When you put this and the necklace together, and the replicas being worn by our model, you get what's described by the uh, prehistoric specialist on jewellery as the prehistoric supernatural power dressing. A really good bit of bling. You can see how the tin, once it's burnished, really stands out and catches the eye. Tin, as I hinted to, is a really valuable commodity, a uh, valuable resource. Who had power to exploit that, uh, extract the material and trade with it? Whoever they were had great contacts with other traders who could bring in the amber from far away from across Northern Europe and had contacts to get the valuable shale beads from Dorset as well. But it doesn't just look good as well. We think they may have had protective or healing qualities. Tin has a kind of charge associated to it, has electromagnetic properties, as does uh, amber as well. Amber has also got a lot of folklore about being protective and being healing. So these, you can see how easily it is to think that these, this jewellery also had a supernatural quality as well. It's having that wealth statement about it as well. Absolutely incredible. The appearance of this being worn, coupled with those ear and nose librettes and studs, must have been quite something. <clears throat> but still, the finds kept coming. Underneath the basketry, we found an animal pelt, and this is it cleaned up. Uh, pretty good animal fur, but the experts really struggled to find what type of animal it belonged to. Uh, amongst all the fur, uh, we found a copper pin. You can see a picture of it there in the bottom left corner. And we think this was a fastener, because within, wrapped around and within this animal fur, uh, this animal pelt was wrapping around the actual cremated bones of the person who was buried in the kist. On closer analysis, it was revealed that this animal pelt actually came from the trunk of a bear. So we think, well, obviously bears were walking around the landscape at this time. But again, this important object being taken out of society and put in a burial, we have had, maybe they were helping to some of the qualities of the bear, the properties of the bear being associated with this person. Now, <clears throat> none of the skin survived from the, from the burial, that all rotted away, just the fur survived. But from it was that from the excavation and the way the survival of the pelt would, uh, would remain, we put the, uh, the skin of the animal pelt 
had been deliberately placed to enclose the, the bones. And that would have been significant to have that skin on skin contact with the person who died's bones. And this is, what, for me, that gets really interesting, the study of these bones. Uh, what survived the cremation fire was about 700 grams of burnt cremated material. And from that little amount of evidence, the bone expert was able to extrapolate that uh, because just down here, yeah, these roots, the, the two fruits were not exposed. And I believe one of these bones may have been what's called a medieval clavicle that hadn't fused. The bone expert was able to put a tentative date that this individual was between 50 and 25 years old. Given the gracile nature of these bones as well, especially the, the, the clavicle bone there, and the type of jewellery we're getting, we can't say for certain, but it seems very likely that the individual we have here is a young female. Uh, it seems likely that necklaces seem to be associated with female burials, where with male burials, you just tend to get more tools, kind of referred to as weapons surviving in that burial deposit. Amongst the bones, we found bits of wood charcoal as well from the hewn funeral pyre. And it looks like the burial, uh, sorry, the, the cremation took place on an oak pyre, which was primed with hazel staves to get the fire going. And it probably burned at a temperature of about 650 degrees, which left very little because the combustion was so high. There's very, very, very little charcoal left. But from that charcoal, even though there's a very little surviving, the wood expert believes that there was some uh, <clears throat> some worked oak, maybe a staff, a staff, or uh, maybe some type of carved object left and it all cremated as part of the, uh, the ritual. Okay, so I hope I haven't blasted you all with facts, but it just keeps coming, I'm afraid, for the organic remains, because underneath the animal pelt, we found another unique object. Uh, a multi-composite textile and animal skin type of garment, we think it is. Not much survived, but this object was obviously of such importance, either personal or had, of course, spiritual connotations or ceremonial connotations, that it was placed in burials, the fundamental thinking which went in the burial deposit first. And what we've got here <clears throat> is on the left-hand side, a woven textile panel, which is actually made out of fibers and that's been stitched again using cow hair to some animal skin with that decoration of some beautiful animal skin triangles making that nice fringe on the right hand side there with some seam uh, binding separating the two now, as far as i'm aware this is the only type of this type of object which has ever been found certainly in britain as well and it's just amazing to think this has all survived probably because that deposit sealed by the peak growth from a later period, which probably kept out the oxygen. So there are the objects we have found. <clears throat> what about the other remains as well, the micro remains from the pollen and uh, the fungal spores? Well, the careful analysis of that revealed that sludgy plant degraded material which surrounded that deposit turned out to be purple grass, which is probably gathered locally from and that kind of tells us that we can see more at the time. And that suggests, along with the pollen which was found in there, that Dartmoor was just coming out of a really wet period, unbelievable, I know, and the conditions are just starting to dry out from blanket bog to a miry type environment where purple moor grass was just becoming established. Looking at the electron microscopes and the, which they used, they were able to identify pollen on top of the deposit from the flower called meadow sweet. And it's likely, because of the abundance of pollen which survived on top of the deposit, there was an actual floral tribute placed on the cremation deposit. Isn't that incredible? And uh, that was from meadow sweet. And meadow sweet blooms kind of this time of year, August, July, August, September. So it's very likely that this deposit was done this time of year, towards the end of the summer. And in the top left there, you can see a scientist, and the scientists extracted a lot more information as well. And from the fungal spores they retrieved from their sample tins and samples, they realised this was in a grazed landscape this, at the time. And there were animals grazing it, and fungi growing on the fungus had left its spores, which had blown off and they had got into the kist. 
And we also know there's woodland nearby, probably hazel woodland may have been managed to where hazel stakes would have come from with oak stands as well. We're just starting to get into a world where grazing is starting to play a lot more prominence on Dartmoor. And we'll explore that at the next slide. So we're able to tell a nice little story here of how someone with high connections, <clears throat> probably of high status, who had accumulated all this wealth and resources throughout their lifetime, was subject to this ceremonial cremation. This special, uh, important place in the landscape where their remains and their jewellery uh, were kept to one side. As their body was burnt, the bones were cut up, and then they were carefully interred into a kist in this special part of Dartmoor. So it just makes you think how many other kists might be out there, <clears throat> how many other sites awaiting discovery. Okay, so that was more of a whistle-stop tour of the Whitehall Seal Kist. We'll move on now to look at the life side of the talk <clears throat> with the excavation of the hut circle at Belliver, right in the middle of Dartmoor in the Belliver Plantation. And this is the site last summer after we'd finished the excavations and put the site to bed as it were. And you can see a hut circle. Here's the outer wall, the entrance way, and it's a beast. It's about 12 metres in diameter with an internal uh, uh, length of about 10 metres as well. And it's now in a very open landscape. The trees around it have all been felled. But if we go back to 1990, you can see there's a very different story. You can see how once upon a time when the plantation was uh, uh, sown, the trees were actually put right across the hut circle. And it wasn't until the 1970s that these trees on the hut circle were actually taken down as part of the archaeological management plan. But these spruce trees are allowed to grow. And unfortunately, in 2007, there was a huge storm which upended all those trees and the root plates were such they impacted onto our hut circle, disturbing the wall and some of the roots themselves went in through the doorway and ripped up the interior of the hut circle. So this provided us with an opportunity to see what actually survived that earlier afforestation and also undertaken a dig of a Dartmoor hut circle, because very few have been done using modern techniques. And rather like what we've just been talking about at Whitehall Sill, with the appliance and scientific approaches and a more methodological approach to archaeological excavation, so we can extract information. And so I'm going to talk you through the excavation and how we encountered the various phases of the hut circle dig. So after we stripped off the peat, we came down to the wall tumble. And you can see here, the hut circle wall itself, and after about three and a half thousand years of, uh, <coughs> of abandonment, so that granite material has slumped into the interior of the hut circle. But on closer analysis and observation whilst we're undertaking this work, it's not just a simple case of it being abandoned. We actually found that on top of this wall tumble, a structure had been built, and the photo doesn't really do this justice, but there is a square cairn here, okay, and that's built on top of the tumble. So here's a picture of the uh, abandonment cairn, as we called it, which was built on top of the wall tumble. So someone had come back, or a group of people had come back, they built this to mark this site, even though it would probably fallen out of use maybe hundreds of years before leave within the can this rubbing stone uh, which is constructed sorry which is uh, used uh, the, the material used to make this rubbing stone is sandstone and uh, we've had a, an experts had a look at it and they're pretty convinced it was probably used for rubbing animal hides and preparing them uh, for making clothes out of so really intriguing how this story of this can carried on and was still significant even though after it had long ceased to be lived in so as we removed all that tumble, we came down to the paved floor area. And here you can see just by the entrance where you'd need to reinforce that heavily used area with people and maybe animals coming in and out, uh, this beautifully laid paving. And it was really well laid. It was like a professional firm had come in and, and done it uh, carefully. Measured. And uh, <clears throat> we lifted the stone. That took a, a, quite a quite a few hours to lift that heavy stone. And that's when we started to get 
into this accumulation layer. Andy, are the slides still moving forward? Yeah, no, Great. Good. Okay, so I think this is where we almost got to. And throughout the interior of the hut circle, we found all the way around the outer edges, this dark, silty, grey, greasy material, which had a lot of pottery in it. 154 sherds of Trevisca ware pottery, which, as I mentioned, contains heroic clay, or some of it does, which has come from the Lizard Peninsula. And was that the clay being exported or the pottery vessels themselves being exported? <clears throat> it has a very distinctive pattern as well. And I think this is where I got to. Uh, on this slide, the pottery, when we mapped it out, plotted it, all the curds on the western and southern sides of the hut circle, and it seemed to be deliberately laid down with the inner surface facing upwards. Now, we think that may have been a deliberate kind of closing down activity when the phase of activity of the hut circle came to an end. Perhaps it stopped being lived in and it became a, an animal pen and they needed to reinforce the entrance way with paving slabs. Who, who can really tell at the moment? But what's interesting is the distribution of that pottery but also corresponds with the light coming in with the entrance from the southwest. So that would have been the part of the hut circle which would have seen most would have received most daylight during the day. And that is common for most of Dartmoor's hut circles, where the doorway is just off centre of south. <clears throat> As we removed the accumulation of deposit, so we started to get into structural elements. And it is very unclear if these hut, these holes you can see were sealed by that accumulation layer, or it was just really difficult to identify the, the lines and distinctions. Uh, digging on granite is really difficult. There are different actual variations of colour of the gravels and the soils and the granite itself, which makes people identify features which are natural and vice versa. It can be very tricky. Uh, but as we remove that accumulation, we, start, we started to reveal about 50 or 60 stake holes, I think it's 57, all the way around the perimeter. And that hadn't been picked up before in the Dartmoor Hut Circle. Often we think of these structures as very crude, quite rude structures, but it's likely there may be a lining separating that external stonework, internal stonework that wouldn't have been seen. A wattle and daub structure would have helped provide another layer of insulation as well. And within a lot of these stake holes, were <coughs> vertically set bits of pottery as well, probably to help hold the stakes up. And often the stakes were intercutting, the holes were intercutting, but they had to insert a new stake where it rotted away. These were the clearest pattern we could find. There are many other internal stake holes as well, which were very hard to identify a pattern. They could relate to internal subdivisions within the structure, or maybe supports for equipment and stand storage, that type of thing. This is a picture of the uh, English heritage scientist who was called out because we found some preserved wood. That black smudge there was in fact preserved wood, about three and a half thousand years old. It was too fragile, uh, too fragile to lift and take to the laboratory, unfortunately, but the scientist here managed to have a look at it through her, one of her hand lenses. I'm pretty certain it was oak and may have come from this woodland and it's tempting to think it might form part of the structure of that inner lining. You can see its association with all the stakeholders. Here is one of the 11 post holes for roof supports which I'll talk about in a minute. Now one thing we didn't find conclusive evidence for was any form of hearth or cooking area but we did find this is a profile of a rather odd shaped hole which you can in profile here had a concave bottom and we know from other excavations on Dartmoor and elsewhere that there are often these things called cooking holes set up next to hearths where stone was heated on the hearth and then placed in these holes inside a pottery vessel which had been set within that hole and so to cook the food or <coughs> heat up heat up the <coughs> and next door to this post hole, this uh, very strange to say post hole, was an area of possibly heat affected clay. So it's tempting to think that's where the hearth may have been. However, maybe there wasn't a hearth here. Maybe this hut circle was too valuable to risk having a fire within. And we'll talk about that a little bit in another slide. 
So this is a shot of uh, the, uh, the the hot circle at the end of the excavation, and all the cut features have been revealed. And you can see highlighted with the, with the yellow hats, uh, nine large post holes forming a ring for the roof support posts. And they would have held up a very substantial thatched roof, complete with joists coming down, running off a ring frame and resting onto the stone uh, walling. And we're looking straight towards the entranceway, which had been bashed by the, uh, the upturned tree, you can see in the background. We can also see some of the other cut features and post holes, which may have related to other internal structures, which we haven't found further evidence for, or may have represented earlier posts, which needed a replacement at a later date. And at the front here, in the distance, you can see two posts for the door as well. It seems like there are some large door posts just set within from the door jet, the stone jams for the entranceway. So quite a lot of going on here. These were well built, well thought out, carefully arranged and organized spaces. In the post holes, in the nine post holes, we found lots of charcoal, which we sampled. And it was only last year we managed to find the resources to get all that dating. So uh, uh, all that charcoal dated, the carbon-14 dating. And uh, <clears throat> this has turned out to be one of the, probably the best dated hut circle in the southwest. And uh, we've got 16 radio carbon dates now. And it seems very likely uh, but the hut circle was being occupied from about 1600 BC, so nearly three and a half thousand years ago, to about 1200 BC, so probably about 400 years, and then it was abandoned. Uh, and from the analysis of all the pollen and all the other uh, um, uh, plant remains, it seems that the landscape around is very heavily grazed. There have been improved grassland with heather close by, uh, and woodland was in the area, but not on the scale as it was during the White Horse Hill burial, which if you remember was probably about 500 years before this hut circle was built or mainly being occupied in. Uh, uh, so woodland had retreated and was being managed. Uh, and just trying to get across uh, on this talk how we often look at the Bronze Age as a very stone inorganic world, where it was anything but. It's only the granite remains and the banks of the enclosures and the parallel reef system, and the huts and the stone circles and the stone roads, which has obviously survived. But just imagine all the wooden remains, all the, in the organic remains as well, which would have brought color uh, to that world as well. Or the hedges, for example, think of a boring example, which have rotted away. Maybe totem poles associated with the ritual monuments as well. Uh, the scope, the, 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 the clothing, uh, the ornaments for the body, everything, the containers for everyday use, uh, it's very, it's, it's, these two excavations have really brought colour, I find, to Dartmoor's archaeology.